A Prince Harry met President Obama in Toronto in September during the Invictus Games. To talk about his memories of the day he left office, his post-presidential work with the Obama Foundation, and his hopes for the future. I understand this is the first interview that you've that you've said yes to doing post handing over handing over the reins as such. It's true. Um, for for eight years, your alarm went off. You you woke up to the realization that you were president of the United States and faced immediately with a million challenges. Um, when you wake up now as Barack Obama, former president of the United States, what's different about your mornings? Uh, I wake up later. Okay. <laughs> and. You know, it's wonderful to be able to control your day in a way that you just can't as, as president. The job entailed uh, a wide range of responsibilities and a constantly full inbox. And uh, now, when I wake up, I can make my own decisions about you know, how do I want to spend my time? What do I need to do to move forward the things that I care deeply about? And that's obviously hugely liberating. But the things that are important to me haven't changed. You know, I, I still care about making sure that the United States uh, and the world is a place where kids get a decent education, where people who are willing to work hard are able to find a job that pays a living wage, uh, that we're conserving the amazing resources of our planet so that future generations uh, can in enjoy the, the beauty of this place like we did. And so, uh, although I don't have the same tools that I had as president, you know, I have to rely more on uh, persuasion than legislation, for example. A lot of the things that uh, still motivate me and move me continue to this day. What do you miss the most? Well, I have to say, uh, because we were both in traffic, today uh you know the fact that i didn't used to experience traffic i used to cause traffic yes. much to the consternation of any place that i was visiting mm -hmm. uh, you know i miss my team you know there's a camaraderie and an intensity to the work mm. everything you do every day you know can affect millions or billions of people in some cases and, and to have really smart focused people who are there for the right reasons uh, and who over time have built up trust and have, have learned to support each other and rely on each other. I, I miss that. I miss the work itself uh, because it was fascinating. Rewarding as well. And, and rewarding. And, and you knew that even if the politics of a certain issue didn't always work out well, that uh, by doing a good job, there was somebody out there maybe a mother who you know, was worried about a sick child and now had a doctor, or you know, your ability to protect some people from those who would do them harm. Uh, you know, that kind of day-to-day -day satisfaction, I think, is hard to match. Can I take you back to the 20th of January, 2017? You're sat in Marine One, the presidential helicopter, flying over Washington. You've sat through the inauguration with your game face on, not giving much emotion away, as we all saw. Uh, what's, going, what's going through your mind? You know, the first thing that went through my mind was, sitting across from Michelle, how thankful I was that she had been my partner through that whole process. You know, you've gotten to know Michelle quite well, and uh, she is a spectacular, funny uh, warm person she's not someone who was naturally inclined to politics uh, so in some ways despite the fact that she was I think as good of a first lady as there's ever been mm -hmm. you know she did this uh, largely in su support of uh, my decision to run and for us to be able to come out of that intact that you know, our marriage was strong we're still each other's best friends, our daughters turning into amazing young women. The sense that there was a completion uh, and that we had done the work uh, in a way that preserved our integrity uh, and, and less, left us whole um, and that we hadn't fundamentally changed, uh, I think was, uh, was a satisfying feeling. Now, that was mixed with all the work that was still undone and 
concerns about how the country uh, moves forward. Uh, but uh, you know, overall, there was there was a serenity there, uh, more than I would have expected. Was there was there was there a sense of relief? Was there a sense of job done as best as you could? Was a unfinished business? Uh, it, uh, relief probably uh, isn't the right phrase because relief indicates some sense that oh, I can't wait until this thing is finished. No, sure, uh, the, pres- the pressure. But, but I think that there was a sense that that we had run a good race. Uh, and one of the metaphors I always used for the presidency is that you are a relay runner. Uh, th- there's a the sense sometimes in any position of, of leadership that you by yourself do certain things and then uh, it's over. And I always viewed it as taking the baton from a whole range of people who had come before me, some of whom had been heroic, some of whom had screwed up. But wherever you were in the race, if you ran hard, if you did your best, and that you then were able to pass that baton off uh, successfully and the country was better off, the world was a little bit better off, then when you got there, then, then you could take some pride in that. And I think we were able to do that. For 16 years... You've been on the most punishing political treadmill imaginable. Um, but in 2000, no one knew who you were. Right. Four years later, you gave a speech which changed your life and you were elected to the Senate. Uh, four years after that, you were elected president of the United States. Mm. And four years after that, you were elected again. How did it feel to, to step off that treadmill after so much blood, sweat, tears? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I always said to Michelle, and, and I think she would agree with this, that it was some strange good fortune on our part that we didn't become famous or in the public eye in any significant way until we were in our 40s. And so despite this whirlwind that you just described, by the time I was elected to the U.S. Senate and I was a national figure, I was a grown man. I was settled. I was a parent. I had changed diapers or nappies, as you could call them, apparently. Uh, I you know, had, had struggled with figuring out how we were going to pay the bills. We had made sacrifices. You know, Michelle and I had had the arguments that married couples have. And so, in some ways, I think, although the process was in some ways surreal, because it happened so quickly. We were fairly steady in knowing who we were and what we believed in and what was important. And so there was a continuity there. And when I got off the treadmill, so to speak, uh, it didn't feel as if my identity was wrapped up in having had this position. And my relationship with my family and my friends, the values that I cared about, you know, felt pretty consistent, so the, the break did not feel as abrupt. Um, I do think that you know American politics is unique in the sense that there is just a perpetual campaigning taking place. Um, so the idea that I don't have to you know go raise money f- for television ads mm-hmm. that that felt really good. <laughs> uh, the idea that uh, there were certain elements of the job that were largely ceremonial and that I I always tried to do as best I could but that weren't things I necessarily would do on my own Mm -hmm. Um, you know the fact that I was now freed up from some of that Mm -hmm. uh, some of the pomp and circumstance of the presidency that actually felt good as the president you had an an unbelievable power at your fingertips you were in the most powerful chair in the world Mm -hmm. Are there any big challenges which you care deeply about that will be easier to influence without that power? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and and it's one I'm still trying to figure out. I I do think that I am able to focus on what I think are long-term problems Mm -hmm. in a way that, as president, you couldn't always do because your job, in part, is to respond to what's right there in front of you. It was a four, a four to eight year plan rather than a exactly. to 30 year plan. And so you, you take some of the tragedies that have happened recently with hurricanes 
devastating first Houston and parts of Florida and then now Puerto Rico. You know, my job as president in those circumstances was first and foremost to make sure that people got help and that the government was effective and responsive. And I, I'm very proud of the work that we did there. And today, those aren't my direct responsibilities, but I can focus over the next 20 years in making sure that we don't have more hurricanes and natural disasters that are accelerated as a consequence of climate change. Mm -hmm. And the, the ability to focus uh, long term, I think, is a great luxury. It also gives you the ability to, to reflect and study in a way that sometimes as president you couldn't do the way you wanted because you just had to move very, very quickly. One of the interesting things about leaving the presidency is realizing that uh, my life had been so accelerated, everything felt like and still feels to some degree like it's moving in slow motion. Not necessarily in a bad way, but mm -hmm. I was talking to my lawyer and you know he was saying, we have to meet with somebody right away because they really want to get something done and i said uh okay uh, how about tomorrow he said well no no it's going to take at least two weeks to get it <laughs> and i said and i had to explain you know uh where i'm from right away means if we don't do something in half an hour somebody dies uh so th there's just a, a a lower intensity level Sometimes that means you don't have the same adrenaline rush, but it also means that you can be, I think, more reflective and, and deliberate about uh, the kinds of things you want to get done. So, so you, would you say it's easier? Yes. Yes, but how so? <laughs> the, the fact that I can wake up and if I want to spend an extra 45 minutes talking to Michelle mm -hmm. uh, and take a long breakfast, mm -hmm. I can do it. Uh, that feels great. And uh, I also think that it allows me to, to focus on how do I transmit whatever knowledge or experience that I've gained uh, to others to help them become more effective and more powerful. And, and I'm really obsessed now with training the next generation of leaders uh, to be able to make their mark in the world. The last time that um, you and I uh, met was it uh, was in London, yeah. and um, we spoke about how we could potentially work together on providing a platform for for young people yeah. to lead, uh, which I know is something close to your heart. I'm I'm certainly passionate about it as well. We're not the first people to say this. Right. I mean, I, I think uh, Whitney Houston even went on about it when I was born back in the 1980s. Um, but how how do we actually make it a reality? It's all well and good standing up saying. We need to let youth lead and we need to listen to them because they've got you know, fantastic ideas and they are inevitably the ones that are going to inherit the, the mess that we leave behind. But what, what does that platform look like for you? How do we, how do we give them a voice? Well, uh, this is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. If you think about my campaign in 2007, 2008, you have this African-American, a mixed race, born in Hawaii, named Barack Hussein Obama, and somehow he becomes president. How did that happen? Well, it happened primarily because you had a bunch of 20-year-olds and 23-year-olds and 25-year-olds who started going out into communities that oftentimes they had never been in before and believed in the possibilities of a different kind of politics. And it was that grassroots army that really fueled my campaign, in part brought together by the new technologies at the time of social media. Oh, you're the first social media I, president. Yeah. Um, while I was president, I made a practice of meeting with young people everywhere I traveled. I'd have town hall meetings mm -hmm. uh, along with the meetings that I had to have with prime ministers and presidents and, and my official duties. And what we discovered was is that young people were so interested in finding platforms for them to not just interact with me, but more importantly, interact with each other and come up with plans for how they might improve health care in their country or how they could conserve the, the natural resources of their country, that we set up this Young Leaders Program. We would bring over to the United States maybe 500, then 1,000, maybe a couple of thousand 
amazing young people from around the world every year. But for each one person that we brought here, there were a hundred who would apply, who would become part of a digital network that was interested in social change. And we now have probably close to a million young people around the world who signed up and are, right as we speak, active in setting up health clinics in rural Africa or participating in human rights programs uh, in countries that sorely need them. So I've seen the power of these young people. And I think that the, the key, and this sounds simplistic, but it's true, is to have confidence and give young people the ability to make decisions and drive their own organizations. Give, give them the ability to uh, go out there and, uh, and change the world. Do you not feel as though the, old generation, the older generation are slightly skeptical about of course. leadership? I mean, with the experience... Yes, of, of, of course they're skeptical. And young people will make mistakes. They're not perfect. I'm, you know, I, when I think about myself at the age of 23, 24, when I was a young community organizer, I was out there making mistakes all the time. But there is a energy and a spirit that can't be duplicated by somebody my age at, at the age of 56. There is a, a freshness to what young people perceive as possible. One of the things that I've discovered, I think, around the world, not just in the United States, is this generation coming up is the most sophisticated, the most tolerant in many ways, or, uh, most embracing of diversity, the most tech savvy, mm -hmm. uh, the most entrepreneurial, but they don't have much faith in existing institutions. It's too easy for people to criticize uh, millennials yeah. for being, you know, superficial, selfish, and self-obsessed. Self yeah, I just haven't, I, I haven't found that. I haven't seen it. Uh, I, I think it is a, an indication of the disconnect between... Generational divide. You know, not just a generational divide. I think it's also a, the bias of those who are comfortable with power as it's currently exercised. Mm -hmm. And it's up to folks like you and me who have an outsized voice to be able to encourage young people to think in new ways about social organizations and social arrangements. You managed to get people to use technology to take real action when you were elected um, all that time ago. Yeah. Part of me wants to ask how you managed that, but at the same time, I think what I will do is Social media, the, so, the social media landscape has changed dramatically it has. Um, since then. Uh, issues of trolling, extre extremism, fake news, and cyberbullying are yeah. major social issues. Right. Is there is there more that you could have done as president to get ahead of some of these issues? Do you think? Well, most of this is happening in the outside of government, and in the United States in particular, we have a very strong First Amendment. Uh, I am a as a former constitutional lawyer, pretty firm about uh, the merits of uh, free speech. And the, the question, I think, really has to do with how do we harness this technology in a way that allows a multiplicity of voices, allows a diversity of views, but doesn't lead to a balkanization of our society, but rather continues to promote ways of finding common ground mm -hmm. and I'm not sure government can legislate that mm -hmm. but what I do believe is that all of us in leadership have to find ways in which we can recreate a common space on the internet mm -hmm. one of the, the dangers of the internet is is that people can have entirely different realities they can be just cocooned in yep. information that re reinforces their current biases. One of the things that I think I discovered even back in 2007, 2008 is a good way of fighting against that is making sure that online communities don't just stay online, that they move offline. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is that I think the social media is a really powerful tool for people of common interests to convene and get to know each other and connect but then it's important for them to get offline mm -hmm. meet meet in a pub get out <laughs> meet, into the community you know, yeah. meet, meet it at a at a 
place of worship, mm -hmm. meet in a neighborhood, and get to know each other. Because the truth is, is that on the internet, everything is simplified. And when you meet people face to face, it turns out they're complicated. You know, there may be somebody who you think is diametrically opposed to you when it comes to their political views, but you root for the same sports team, or you notice that they're really good parents, and that's something that you as a parent care about. And debating it's important. And and you find areas of common ground because you see that things aren't as simple as have, have been portrayed in whatever chat room you've been in. Mm. And it's also, by the way, harder to be as obnoxious and cruel in person, <laughs> in person as people can be yeah. anonymously on the internet. And, and so w one of the things we want to do, I think, is as we're working with young people to build up platforms for social change, make sure that they don't think just sending out a hashtag in and of itself is bringing about change. It can be a powerful way to raise awareness, but then you have to get on the ground and you actually have to do something. You can understand why some people look at politics and the strain and scrutiny that it will place on them and their families yeah. and say, well, that's not for me, thanks. Um, you know, you, you chose public life, your family didn't. It's hard. Being in the public eye is unpleasant in a lot of ways. It is challenging in a lot of ways. Your loved ones are made vulnerable in ways that might not have been true 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So it is a sacrifice that I think everybody has to be at peace with when they decide to go into politics. But ultimately, I think the rewards of bringing about positive change in this world make it worthwhile. Michelle and I were able to protect our girls from too much scrutiny. I appreciate the fact that there was some restraint by journalists uh, in focusing attention on them when they were growing up. I developed a very thick skin, and you know, th that comes in handy if you're going to go in, into politics because mm -hmm. at any given moment, somebody is an unhappy with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But what, what an enormous blessing it is uh, to be able to say that 20 million people have health insurance that didn't have it before. Mm -hmm. and even a fraction of those 20 million mm -hmm. are leading better, healthier lives, are, are happier, some child is fulfilling their potential. That You've made a massive difference. Then, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good scorecard. It's a, it's a huge difference. Yeah. At the end of 2016, a lot of people were pretty relieved that 2016 had finished. It was a quite a, it was quite a, a turbulent year, emotional year for a lot yeah. of people. Um, 2017 hasn't exactly been easy. <laughs> Uh, for, the, for the world, uh -huh. uh, many people are worried about the direction that the world is the yeah. world is headed. Can you give the people a reason to feel optimistic about the year ahead? Well, Please. you know, I, I, I don't think in terms of uh, one year, but I I can tell people what I genuinely believe, which is uh, that if we take responsibility for being involved in our own fate, if we participate if we engage, if we speak out, if we work in our communities, if we volunteer, if we see the, the joy that comes from uh, service, to, service others. to others, then all the problems that we face are solvable, mm -hmm. despite all the terrible news that you see, despite all the genuine cruelty and pain and uh, hardship that people are experiencing around the world at any given moment of any given day. If you had to choose a moment in human history in which you would want to be born and you didn't know ahead of time whether you were going to be Prince Harry or Barack Obama or a small child in rural Africa or India, you'd choose today because the fact is, is that the world is healthier, wealthier, better educated, more tolerant, more sophisticated, and less violent mm -hmm. than just about any time in human history. You, you think about the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. It was only a few generations ago where someone who looked like me was in bondage. Mm -hmm. Or if not in bondage, then servitude. And couldn't even imagine having this conversation in this hotel room. Mm -hmm. It was just a few generations ago where, where routinely women couldn't aspire to anything beyond mm -hmm. caring for their children. 
the most noble thing you can do, but yeah, I want my daughters to be able to do other things, and they can do other things now while still raising a family. It was just a few generations ago at a time when your grandmother, Her Majesty, was already an adult when half the world was aflame and 60 million people were killed in a great global war. And when you think about the strides we've made just in my lifetime, and mm-hmm. I have some gray hair, but on the scale of human history, I'm, I'm a blink of the eye. <laughs> you think about how much has changed and, and how much has gotten better. Mm-hmm. Well, then that, that has to make you optimistic as long as you don't start thinking that any of us can sit back passively and, and assume it continues. History doesn't just run forward. It runs backwards and sideways, and it requires us to continually push. Um, one sentence. What is your New Year's resolution? Well, this past year, my New Year's resolution That's was... I'm sorry. I'm just going to one sentence, please. <laughs> Well, if you're going to ask it that way, then I don't have one because, uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure I believe in New Year's resolutions. Typically, people break them. I believe in making sure that each day you try to do a little bit better than you did before. Perfect. Okay. Um, Just now, just quickly onto the serious questions. Very, very quickly. You ready? Yes. It's a quick fire. It's a quick fire question round. Uh, White House down or Olympus has fallen? Didn't see either of them. You have to make a choice. I didn't see either of them. How can I make a choice? What else done? Okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, what do you miss the most, the cinema or the bowling alley? Uh, cinema. All, we call it a movie theater, but okay. that's fine. Boxes or briefs? Uh, sorry, we don't answer those questions. <laughs> LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Jordan. Uh, although I love LeBron, but I'm a Chicago guy. Aretha Franklin or Tina Turner? Aretha's the best. Rachel or Monica? Uh, I like Rachel. Okay. I'll, I'll, I won't be telling Monica that. Uh, Kim or Chloe? The, the, this one uh, I, I have to uh, I have to defer on. Okay, Harry or William? William, right now. <laughs> Titanic or the Bodyguard? Titanic. Suits or the Good Wife? Suits, obviously. Great, great, great answer. Uh, cigarettes or gum? Gum now, baby. Gum. Uh, White House or Buckingham Palace? White House, uh, just because Buckingham Palace looks like it would take a really long time to mow. Okay, fair enough. Uh, a lot of upkeep. Queen or the Queen? The Queen. Okay, good answer again. Uh, the Rock or Chris Rock? That's an interesting question. I like them both. Slip and slide or electric slide? Electric slide. That's uh, my generation. Fantastic answer. And lastly, uh, your last $5, buy a burger or buy a lottery ticket? It depends on how good the burger is, but I like a good burger. Okay, good. Mr. President, thank you very, very much for sparing your time i'm sorry we, we ran over a bit but um your highness i i enjoyed this especially the lightning round <laughs> Good. appreciate you thank you bye